Hi, good afternoon, guys and girls, and um, welcome to Escape Studios webinar on bedroom skills um, with me, Mark Spevick, the head of 3D. And um, today's bedroom skills, we're going to be talking about how to break free with Houdini's glue, um, as you can see here on the slide. So good afternoon, guys and girls. Hopefully, I won't um, stress your minds out too much, but what we're going to do is we're going to have an investigation into Houdini's glue constraint. Um, let me just pop up Houdini for a minute. Um, I'll dive straight in. Now, the plan for today is that I'm going to run about 45 minutes with some of the examples I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to allow sort of 10 to 15 minutes at the end for you to ask questions, which you should be able to do through the chat part of the uh, webinar there. So, yeah, um, what we're going to do today is um, just discuss a little bit about Houdini's dynamic glue constraints, and I'm going to assume that people already have um, a bit of a knowledge about Houdini and its various techniques. So I'm not going to go too much into the basics. What I'm more trying to show people is how the glue constraints now are beginning to work in Houdini 15. Um, quite a lot has changed with the dynamics and sort of since version 9 when they first brought dynamics in. But um, recently in this version 15, um, and in 14 to some degree, there's an awful lot of simplifications in the workflows. And it's some of those simplifications I'd like to sort of demonstrate today. More importantly is how we can then control simulations using some of those principles, in particularly the glue constraint networks. So let's start off by setting up a very simple glue constraint network, and then we can sort of have a look at just exactly how we can control it to get the kind of effects that we want. So I'm going to start very simply with just a box. So as true Houdini, control left click on the box, which will pop up to the origin for you. And I'm going to dive inside the box network. Inside the box network, what I'd like to do is actually put this box on the grid. And this is a fairly standard Houdini trick. And that is to um, offset the center here. If you see the center, that moves the center of the cube. Offset that, offset that by half the size. So in other words, I'm moving it up by half its height. Considering its center was at the grid now, the fact that I've moved it up by half its height means it sits perfectly on the grid. Oh, there we go. Let's just undo that so we come back. Now, if I change the height, as you see, it doesn't stay on the grid. I'd need to now change the center. So in Houdini, we typically would write an expression, and that's very easily done by selecting the parameter we want to drive. Uh, sorry, that we want to use as the controller. So that's the size. And I want to copy a link an expression link of this parameter into the center, so that the center always reads this value. And it's very simple in Houdini. We can literally just left click and drag the number down. And I'm going to choose relative channel references, which gives me a, local, a relative path to that parameter. If you remember, you can hold your cursor over here. And we can see that it says the parameters are size x, size y, and size z. So it's size y I'm interested in, and that's the name that I put in the channel expression. The only problem is, if I click on the word center, we can see this number resolves to two, and in fact, I want it to be half that value. If I click back on the word center, we'll see it gives me the expression. So that toggles between the value and the expression. So what I need to do is multiply this by a half, and that's very simple. I can just put the math in, and now you can see if I click back to the value, we resolve to half that height. If I adjust the value, it's always half the height, and the effect is that this box always appears to sit on the grid. So that's a fairly standard Houdini trick. Um, what I am going to do actually is just reduce the size down to about half a unit. So in Houdini, interesting, if we're talking about dynamics, we need to just worry about um, scene scale, because that's very important when it comes to um, dynamics. Now if I bring up the uh, preferences here, we can look at in the, um, where are they these days, in the preferences, we can go to the hip file options, and that's just up here. And then um, we can just check our units. So if you look here, one unit is one meter, and one unit is one kilogram, which are pretty useful standards. So this is actually half a meter big, and that's quite a large cube. But that's fine. We're interested in more how we can constrain these together. So I just want to make a bunch of cubes so we can see them. So for that, I'm going to use a copy SOP. So let's pop the copy in and wire it together. And uh, as I'm sure you know, on the copy shop, this will allow us to make multiple copies, say 10 copies. And at the moment, they're all in the same place. And look, I can adjust the translate and offset each copy by a certain amount. A bit like Maya's duplicate special. And I'm sure various other softwares have a similar effect. What I really need to do is make sure this is always the height 
of the cube here. That way, they're always going to separate by the right amount. And again, I can write an expression to link that to the size y here of the box. So again, this time, I'm going to right-click and choose Copy Parameter. And in the copy, I'm going to right-click and do Paste Relative References. And this just means they're all now offset by the size of the cube. And to prove that, if I change the size of the cube, not only does it now stay up the grid, but they also stay on top of each other. I want a slight little gap between them. So very simply to this channel expression, I'm going to add an offset of, say, 0 0.05 which just gives us a little gap between them. So we've got a bunch of cubes stocked up with a gap between them. And this is kind of the setup that I'm going to use. Um, in a moment, I'm going to send these into dynamics, into DOPS, and um, we're going to apply a constraint network to that, which will basically glue these cubes together and treat them as one piece. And this is sort of um, one of the ways to sort of destroy things in Houdini. Um, one, of the, one way is to do it automatically, using the uh, make breakable shelf tool, um, which is easy to use, maybe good for secondary stuff, but it's not kind of a technique we would um, tend to use in production, just for the fact that we like to control and choreograph um, our dynamics to the nth degree. Directors like to direct, basically. So what we tend to do is pre-fracture, pre-break all our geometry, and then we will um, glue it all back together and then use some techniques in order to break things off when we want so it's totally directable and that's something we'll visit towards the end today I'm planning to show you how we can control these glues but before I do that I just want to talk about the glue constraints in a bit more depth and in fact I'm going to stop talking referring to them as glue constraints in a moment because what you should really think about them as in Houdini is actually constraint networks so let's not carry on using the word glue anymore and this is one of the things I wanted to demystify we all talk about glue constraints in Houdini and it's got the glue button but actually we're not creating glue at all we are in fact creating a constraint network and what's nice about Houdini is that constraint network can be any constraint that we happen to, to define by default it is glue and that's why they call it the glue network but in reality it's just a constraint network and those constraints can be whatever type we like glue spring pin whatever. So let's investigate that a bit further. Now to do that I need to turn this into a rigid body object and that's quite straightforward enough. Now another common technique in Houdini is to add a null at the end of your network before you do another kind of job. The reason I'm adding a null here, let's call this um, boxes out, is um, the reason I'm adding this null at this point of the network is I'm going to attach my dynamics after this point here. Now, if I want to carry on modeling, what I'd have to do is add those nodes and rewire everything to consider those changes. Whereas, if I wire everything to a null node, I have lots of freedom to add lots of nodes here in between before that null, and I don't need to wire anything back again because it's all plugged into the null, if you like. So it's like a terminator at the end of the chain. So it's, um, not only is it a nice visual thing because quickly you can see where the end is, um, also it just makes editing your networks later much more robust, meaning you don't have to relink all your dependencies. Um, you can add more nodes here and everything's still going to work. The other um, thing we tend to do with these nodes is put them in uppercase. The pure reason for that is they just appear at the top of the list here in the tree view. 